Today we're going to talk about foot exams. We're going to talk a little bit about neuropathy to begin with, and then we'll talk about um, how to do the exams. Everybody got a copy of each of these? I'm going to circulate around is uh, thank you notes. You do not have to sign them. I don't look at them. I don't read them. So if, if you write something, be nice. Uh, one of them is to Dr. LaGreca. So usually I send a note to our uh, uh, guest speakers. So that's one of them. When you start this, Caitlin, put put uh, Dr. LeGrec on the, on the outside. The other one I'm uh, having you sign a uh, thank you for is to the CETL group on campus. Uh, they gave me a grant last year uh, to, uh, based on, uh, to, to uh, purchase things that I needed to, uh, for teaching. So the meters that you used the other day, the tuning forks that you were going to use today, the uh, foot models that I have were all purchased based on their money uh, that, that they gave us. So Monica's going to come down. She's going to take pictures of you during while, while we're doing our foot exams. I want to send them and just show them that we have used and appreciated the materials that they have given. So I'll start this other one in the back. Looks weird, just having normal. Okay, shh, listen. I'm tired, so I'm keeping short. Cassie, on the outside of that envelope, would you put C E T L in capital letters? That way they'll keep it straight as they're going through. Okay, so if you would take out. The diabetic foot exam PBL activity. This is uh, kind of giving you an idea of what we will do on Friday. So today's uh, talk and practice is going to be geared towards what you will do on Friday. So let's go over that so you'll have in mind what you uh, are going to be doing. So the purpose of this activity is to identify. Who has onions? Sorry. That's oh. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I don't have very good smells. <laughs> Okay, so the purpose is to identify and perform the elements of the diabetic foot exam, use a monofilament to determine areas of the foot that are sensate or insensate, use a tuning fork to determine vibratory or vibratory sensation, and document the patient encounter. So it's not only for you to gain a, a physical assessment skill, but also to learn how to document it. Do you usually document, have you done a PBL before? We have, we, have, we have not done. You've only done one. Yeah. Okay. What did you do? Remind me. The what? Rectal and prostate. Okay. That's right. Okay. So the PBL activity will start at. We're starting at eight o'clock. Through uh, everybody will be done by one. Uh, plan to arrive no sooner than ten minutes to your assigned time. I understand that is protocol for you all. Okay. Um, and then uh, wait in the assigned lounge until Monica comes for you, so you all know where that is. Uh -huh. okay. This activity is designed for an individual student to perform a physical evaluation of a diabetic foot on a standardized patient. Uh, students will conduct the evaluation of foot through patient history, physical evaluation of the feet, and through the use of a tuning fork and monofilament. All of those we will cover today. You will do this solo, uh, and you will have 20 minutes to do that. Okay. Materials before entering the room, come to get a monofilament, these little jobbies, 
and a tuning fork from either Monica or myself. Uh, you can take your laminated cards in there. I'm more interested that you do a good and thorough exam than I am. Are you memorizing it? If you want to memorize it, you don't have to take it in there. That is up to you. Um, you will obtain a history from the patient. They will have a preset case information that they will uh, present to you. Uh, the plan now is for the SPs to all have different cases uh, and different physical findings. Uh, so perform a complete foot exam. You have 20 minutes. Return the monofilament and the tuning fork to um, Monica or myself when you're done. And then you leave the building when you're done. That's usual protocol, right? Have I got it all right? Okay. Documentation. You will type up the patient encounter, use the diabetic exam template that I have given you. It's posted on D2L. You have it in paper form. I will go over that today. Okay. Include in the patient encounter note a uh, completed diabetes foot uh, screen form. So on the front, so on this page, This you should have a copy of. You're going to bring this with you and, and fill it out and turn it in. What you put on here should co be consistent with what you put in your note. I'm smiling because last year they didn't always do that. Uh, so you're going to, in, when, you doc, when you do a foot exam, uh, either uh, whether you're dealing with an electronic medical record or a paper, you would have some type of, of uh, template to fill out. Some EMRs have it in there, you download it, do it, and it's electronically saved. Others, you have to do one and have it scanned in. Okay? This is one of the standards of care, so they will look for these when they do audits of your, of your practice. So you'll note there's right and left foot. Even though we always say foot exam, we always do both feet. Uh, so you'll do that. You'll document whether they're sensate or insensate in those red areas. We'll go through that today. And then if they have calluses or ulcerations or anything uh, unusual with their foot, you would use those designations to draw on the, on the diagram and indicate where those are. So when I'm reading your note, I'm looking at this, I'm like, okay, is this consistent? At the bottom, you will do a risk category, and there's a description of this on the back. Ladies, are you all going to be, are you going to pay attention? Do you need to go and get more stuff no, to we'll clean up? We're good. Okay. So risk category assessment needs to be done. This is going to be based on the last page, and you sign it. Okay. The next two pages are somewhat uh, descriptions that went along with this explanations that you may find helpful. The last page gives you the risk. So it gives you a description at the top and it gives you management courses then of things you, what you would do based on that, uh, based on that assessment. You will also have a, uh, this, uh, Maria Jones today will go over this uh, when she does a physical assessment of uh, part of the neuropathic foot. Uh, we are going to use this. There's lots of them out there that usually have the same elements. You will use this then to educate your patient. Uh, you'll see at the, at the end of this template that, you, that I've given you, you have to document patient education. Okay? And so you will use this. I'll look for patient education consistent with what you have told me is wrong with the patient. Um, so we'll, we'll go over this as well. Bring this with you. So you're going to bring your, this sheet that you're going to fill out. You'll bring your laminated card if you want to use it. And you'll bring this with you as well. Yes? Um, for the sheet with the foot on it that we're supposed to fill out, um, are we printing out our report and handing it into you? Or are we emailing it to you? Or, oh. or no? You no, will no, type it's up it's a note and bring it to me on Tuesday, the 14th at 9 a.m. 
Okay. So you will, uh, you have a template. You have a template, two page template, that you will fill in with your exam. So I'm teaching you how to document. This is about as thorough as, as it gets. Okay. And on the back, you will also include your management. So you've done soap notes, yes? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you know you have to have a subjective, so that's included here. You'll have limited, uh, your objective will be your patient will have blood sugars and it will have an A1C. And they will tell you, should ask. If you don't ask, they won't tell you. Um, so you should ask about that. And then you're going to do your physical examination. You're going to document it through this. I've given you language so that you know what appropriate language would be. But there are, you would fill in based on what you've assessed. Okay. Then you know your assessment needs to be consistent with what your subjective has said and your, uh, your objective <coughs> findings. Right? right? I will take off points if those do not line up. You cannot make an assessment that is not has evidence in your subjective and your objective. We'll go through, we will walk through this. Your plan should reflect your assessment. Whatever you've assessed, then your plan should line right up. Your patient's going to have a complaint, so that should be documented in the assessment, I mean, in the subjective. But in the assessment and plan, you must, you must address that objective. Sorry. You must address that complaint. All right. Is that, does that answer your question? So you will type these up, you will attach your foot screen uh, assessment to it, and you will turn it in on Tuesday the nine, at 9 a.m. That's when Dr. Britton uh, will be working with you and coping with chronic disease, and I will come pick those up at that class. Those are the elements of the PDL. So what we're going to practice today is how do you do all that. Um, have you uh, received a note yet from Monica about your times? Okay, mm -hmm. she will send you out the times. Um, so you will be um, starting at 8, and again, we'll be done by 1. The other thing I have posted to D2L is a position statement uh, by the ADA about neuropathic disease or neuropathies. A lot of it's going to is going to be geared towards foot. Even though you can have a autonomic neuropathy, so you can have neuropathies that affect your heart, your gut, uh, your uh, GU tract, those are most common ones. Uh, and you can also have uh, peripheral neuropathies. Mostly they affect the feet and they can affect the hands. Okay? But any nerve in the body can be affected by diabetes. So this is their position statement. So uh, they refer to it in the standards of care, but um, the la this one came out, when was this one? 17, so it's just last year. Okay, questions? All right. Okay, so what we're gonna do today is we are going to, I'm gonna talk a little bit, then we're gonna practice, so I'm gonna have you once I, get done with the first initial part, we have you move into your groups again and you're practicing in groups. So be, be prepared to move when, when we get to that point. Okay. It is really, really important. It's probably the one thing the standards that are hardest to get providers groups to do is foot exam. Takes a little bit of time, documentation's a little bit more, but it often gets overlooked. Uh, often patients will not bring it up to you. If their feet are insensate, they have lost sensation, they may not feel the things that, it may not bother them. So they don't bring it up to you, or they don't want you to know. That's, that's a, also a common one. But simply looking at their feet and, and teaching patients how to do simple things every day will reduce the risk of amputations by 25%. So it's huge to reinforce constantly good foot care. It's just like with type 1, once your, your pancreas can no longer produce insulin, you have to do for it what it cannot do no longer. 
It's the same when the feet become insensate, you have to think for the feet. And doing simple things every day will go a long way in preventing ulcerations, and I don't even talk about infections, infections occurring that will lead to amputations. Once you start getting to amputations, it just never ends. They'll start amputating toes, then it becomes the foot, then it becomes the lower leg, then it becomes the... And usually, usually, it's about a three to five year mortality. Or three to five years usually is about the length of time people last. Usually by the time they get there, they've also got complications in other organs. So kidneys, eyes, lots of macrovascular, and also macrovascular heart disease. Okay, so the most common of the neuropathies is the DSPN, so distal symmetrical polyneuropathy. So both sides, <laughs> usually the same. It affects small fibers and large fibers. We'll talk about what the difference would be uh, in those. These account for 75%, so the majority of, of the neuropathies you're going to see are this. Can other things cause them? Yes. Uh, and you would have a differential that you would want to rule those things out. So the definition is the presence of, of symptoms and signs of a peripheral neuropathy in people with diabetes once you've excluded everything else. Pathogenesis. Here we go, Dim. They don't really know. They don't know exactly what happens to the nerve that causes uh, it then to become dysfunctional. It's thought to be due to oxidative stress, inflammatory stress, uh, the metabolic dysfunction itself, the damage uh, to the nerve cells. And early on, you can those nerve cells can recover. As they go further and further along, they will not recover. Uh, and the organs that they innervate then will um, become as dysfunctional as well. Incidence and prevalence. So, as the longer you've had diabetes, the more likely you are to develop a, a complication. So, uh, this type of neuropathy occurs at least 20% of people with type 1 after 20 years of disease duration. At least 10 to 15 percent of newly diagnosed patients with type 2 have this neuropathy. So see why the recommendations are as soon as you diagnose somebody with type 2, you start doing these referrals. I have seen this. I have seen people sent to me because this was found. They went to the doctor and go, I, you know, I'm having trouble with my feet. So usually in the orthopedics, they're looking for, do you have diabetes if you're a middle-aged or older person? Uh, so that is commonly, it's probably the most common way I have seen people present that are not presenting related to, you know, my, I, my sugars are uh, hyperglycemia. They come in, this complication I've seen the most common as the presenting symptom uh, in diabetes. After 10 years of, of type 2, 50% have this neuropathy. They may or may not have symptoms. They may or may, may, or may not complain to you. It is associated with the degree of glycemic control. Number one, so keeping blood sugars down lowers the risk. We, we saw that in the DCCT trial. Also has to do with the, the taller the person, usually the more likely they are that, to have the disease. Smoking, blood pressure, weight, lipid measure. So what that tells you, it's, it's a metabolic derangement that is also adding to that. Uh, development of this complication. Small fiber neuropathy may be present in 10 to 30 percent of people with prediabetes or metabolic syndrome. So keep that in mind. People are also looking at retinopathy also showing up in prediabetes <coughs> patients because it's the length of time they can have that pre-disease uh, state that leads to the development of complications in some people. So you're going to see some type 2's that never develop one type of complication. Uh, and then you'll see others who will get it very early and it will be ravaging. So there's family history, there's other comorbid diseases that go in the, into whether or not you develop a complication. So they don't all follow the same course. We tend to look at general populations when we're doing these numbers. So have, a, have it high in your mind need to find out what their, foot, what their feet are like. 
So it's an important cause of foot ulceration. So um, you see at the top, that's the, the uh, Charcot foot. Um, I have a model that you can uh, look at of a Charcot foot. This is a pretty diseased one, but you're welcome to come up here and get these and, and take them back and look at them. So this one, this person's lost a toe. Um, they've got some they've got some terrible inflammation and gangrene that has set into this one. Other inflammatory uh, damage here. Ulceration on the bottom. This one's a fairly far advanced. That person um, can't see the bottom of his foot, but. Once they lose that supporting structure and you start putting pressure on areas of the foot that were not designed to carry it, then ulcers tend to follow, usually calluses and then ulcerations. Um, so you see that these are late complications, so lots of damage years have gone by before these types of things happen. Uh, complications drive amputation risk. The number one cause of amputations in the United States is diabetes. They're a predictor of mortality. When you're looking at that, you're also, like I just said, you've also probably got complications in, uh, in other organs. It is a major contributor to falls. They can't feel the end bottom of their feet. So, it, so it's easy for them to take a misstep, uh, fall. They fracture, you get an old person, that is the end. Usually you're, it's, uh, they are very high risk for uh, mortality at that point. So just showing you kind of the architectural change in a, uh, a charco foot versus a, a normal foot. So what do you see there? What's What changes? The arch, they've lost. So that's where some of that, and you see where that bone starts coming down in the middle? So that's where those ulcerations come. That part of the foot was not meant to bear the weight uh, of your body or end up walking. The, yeah, the toes are slightly, uh, we're going to see some other deformities of the toes uh, as well. Whenever you see this, you, it's a referral. Uh, and it's because it won't be long. If you see them normal, I've only seen one that came in that had not ulcerated. Most of the time when I saw them, they had already ulcerated. So getting them into to someone who can then start to do protective and off uh, weight bearing uh, devices is, is best. Okay, so screening. So we, we talked about this in the complications. So all type 2s, when you first see them, yes. Sorry, going back, would that be an ortho mm -hmm. referral or a wound care? Well, well not if it's like this, it would be an ortho okay. referral. Okay, so screening. So type 2s at diagnosis. Type 1s, it's five years after the onset of the disease. Um, symptoms will vary depending on whether you have large fiber involvement, small fiber involvement, or a mix. A lot of times what you, by the time you, they complain about it or they, they show up with both. Um, so small fiber disease usually is what hits them first. Uh, so it's that pain, uh, dysthesia, so the burning sensation that they may complain of. Uh, neuropathic pain uh, would be described as burning, lancinating. They'll, they may talk about like a, someone sticking a dagger down my leg. Um, the, the bee stings, the needle stings that we talked about. Um, electric shock-like uh, repeated uh, sensations. You all told me about the usually worse at night, uh, the hyperesthesias. They don't like anything uh, on top of their feet. Uh, they may even get pain when they put on their shoes or when they put socks on in particular. They may have that same sensation. So exaggerated response to something that would be considered fairly normal activity. Okay, so the large myelinated fibers, their function is pressure and balance. So the symptoms that they would complain of would be numbness, tingling, poor balance. So numbness, they can relate in lots of different ways. It feels like I'm walking on bedding. Uh, it feels like my feet are wrapped in something. Uh, uh, it feels like I've got big, uh, you know, 
fix socks on, I can't feel exactly. Um, the ways that we um, evaluate this would be the ankle reflex. Uh, so, and if, if it's, it would be reduced or absence in people who have a neur neuropathy. The vibration perception, where you see with the tuning fork we're going to do today, that will be diminished. Now, usually we'll lose that first. Um, and then we can look at the monofilament will, will um, test sensation. So we talk about a sensate foot and an insensate foot. We'll talk about sensate areas where sensation is still intact and insensate when it is not. Proprioception, so what's that? Where your body is in space. So they lose that. That's why their balance gets thrown off. They can't really tell where is my foot in space in relationship to the floor. Okay, so there I got numbness, the feeling like their feet are wrapped. They could get, uh, complain of tingling, you know that feeling you get right before your foot goes to sleep, so no pain. Loss of protective sensation, so it's that gift of pain. If you do not perceive pain, then you don't know when you've injured yourself. Let me give you some examples of patients that I've seen. Had one guy who came in on a Tuesday, and he said, I have something wrong with my feet. And I said, okay. He said, I, before I went to church on Sunday, I spilled hot coffee on my feet. I said, okay. And he said, and now I'm, I just, I'm, I'm having some problems. I'd like you to look at it. So he took his socks and shoes off, and his skin fell off all over his foot. It was just hanging in threads all over. He had totally taken all the top skin off of his foot. He couldn't feel it. He even walked to church after he did it. But he couldn't feel the heat, so he didn't rinse it off. Probably left his socks on, and it just soaked in. So all I could do was go get a nurse and a doctor to, uh, to dress it just so we could get in the hospital. Then I spent the next hour trying to talk him to go into the hospital. Which we got him into the hospital. They wanted to amputate, and he said, no, nope, and left. I never saw him after that. Another person, uh, again, involving hot water. It was Thanksgiving time, and he was cooking, and he was moving a pot from the stove to the sink, and he spilled some on his feet. Had, he was barefoot, never thought anything about it until, same thing, skin started coming off. And eventually, he lost his middle toe. They amputated it, and he, uh, we were, they were able to save the rest of his foot. I had another guy who was a mechanic, and he got battery acid spilled on his arm, and he never felt it. It just kept eating away until somebody said, what is wrong with your arm? Mm -hmm. So this is it. They cannot. So those things that are so painful to us, they cannot feel. And so they can sustain a, quite a bit of damage um, until something comes to their attention that makes them see. So one of the things we want to do with patients is tell them, and go over with them, look at your feet every day. I even tell new diabetics to start doing that to develop a habit. Always, always look at your feet. Uh, and if there's anything that is, and you would have to set these parameters up with them, but I always told my patients, if any, uh, you have any sore, any abnormality, I don't care what it is, within 24 hours you call us. Uh, and then we'll determine whether or not to see you. Uh, so even if it's a blister, I can at least talk to them on the phone, here's how I want you to handle this, and here's what I want you to look for. Here's another example of a lady that I saw for a long time. She worked in a nursing home. She was a smoker. Her, her uh, uh, blood sugar was terrible. Her A1C at the time of this event was 15% uh, because she would take her insulin and wouldn't take her insulin, so, and she was a smoker. So she came in to see me one day and she said, I want you to look at something on my leg. I said, okay. I looked at it. I'm like, oh my gosh, what happened to you? Uh, and she said, well, one of the patients in a wheelchair in the nursing home ran into the back of my, she said she bumped my back of my leg with her wheelchair. I said, okay. What did you do? And she goes, well, nothing. It, I mean, it was just a momentary thing. It wasn't even that big of a deal. 
Uh, but she said, I noticed the skin start breaking down, so I told my, uh, when I went in to see my primary care doctor, I showed it to him, and he said, well, we'll just watch it. Well, I'm, I'm sure it did not look as bad as the, the day I saw it. Um, so, have a seat. We're not quite there yet. Um, <laughs> So I, so I went and I called, I, I, I got my attending and, and uh, I got on the phone and I called the wound people that day. I, I love wound people, man oh man, they are something else, they're angels. Because they worked with her for 18 months mm -hmm. and they saved her leg. Amazingly, they saved her leg. Uh, but we got her to quit smoking, we got her A1C down to less than 7%. She was motivated at that point. But it still took 18 months, and it was never a sure thing until the last few months that they could get that thing saved. So that's why I'm telling you that what looks like a cut today can develop into a big infection in a few days. So I always tell them, any break, any fissure, anything, you call the clinic. Now, you can decide how you handle that yourself, but uh, those are... You should have Dr. Britton tell you his story about the woman who came in, she, and patients will not want to take off their shoes. To me, that's always a, a clue that something is going on. But I have taken stuff off and go, how long has this been going on? Oh, I don't know. So they don't want you to mess with them sometimes. I'll show you some pictures of that. But he had a lady who came in. Uh, she had a definite ulceration. He put in all the, the paperwork, got everything set up. Um, fell through the crack, delayed, delays, things weren't seen, things weren't done, and she eventually lost her foot, her amputation. I can't tell you how often things fall through the cracks. I'm telling you, it costs you more time when those things happen if you will simply get on the phone and push and push until you can get things done. Uh, you're, it's, it's the best thing for your patient. But I can't tell you how many people are like, this is where my job stops, and whatever happens to you beyond that is, is just what happens. You'll run into it all the time. People get overwhelmed, they get desensitized, um, they, they know how much more it costs them to do that, but I'm telling you, it affects people major time. And she lost her life because of it. Okay. Um, no susception. So these are the small fibers. These are usually the, that burning pain, the shocking pain, stabbing pain. That's the small, uh, small uh, fibers. Two uh, exams that are done, thermal and pin pinprick. I'll tell you that I do not see, I'm not saying that these aren't important. I'll just tell you that the majority of people don't tend to do these in primary care. I think because most of the time, by the time we see folks, uh, they've already got mixed fibers, and we can pick up the other things on the with the, the tuning fork in the monofilament. By far, monofilament is used the most. Um, these will tell you small fiber disease, but you don't really do anything different. Um, so with the thermal, they will use a tuning fork. They'll stick it in a, a bath of cold water, and they'll put it on the patient and see if they can determine or discriminate cold from not cold. Um, I understand that there are machines that they are in development in use in Europe that can simulate cold, and you can use that as a test. Pinbrick, I'll show you a video here uh, in a minute. Uh, a lot of people don't do those. Uh, you have to keep a, a, a supply of, of disposable needles. I'm always worried about in breaking the skin and infecting them, so I don't do it. Uh, it may be that some of the endos, endos do or neurologist. So this is the pinprick test. Let me just show it to you so you'll have an idea of what it is. So this is a disposable pin. It's applied to the proximal skin, right? So the skin right below the big toe. And you are going to indent the, the skin enough to dimple it, but not pierce it. Uh, and then the, you're asking the patient to close their eyes and tell you if they, what they feel. Uh, you can, if that's insensate, you can keep moving up the foot until you can find the point where they are sensate. You can tell different dermatomes. There's about four dermatomes in the foot. Uh, and so you can actually tell by, look, by you looking at those different ones which uh, are testing those different parts to see where it is.
Where's the sound, Jenna? Yeah, right where you are. Right here. a blunted pen. They're designed for this this test. So you don't use, I've seen people without their testing like, F5. And then to the fifth toe, testing no, S1. Doing? The okay. test is performed initially either on the patient's arm or hand so that Test. This is for sensation of pinprick. On the diabetic foot, we have three dermatomes that we can test the L4, L5, and S1 on the lateral uh, side of the foot over the fifth toe. The test is very simple and easy to perform using a disposable pin. You don't want to reuse these. You're going to apply very light pressure to the dorsal surface of the toe just below the nail, just enough to deform the skin but not draw blood. So this will be testing the L4, then you can come to the second or third toe, testing L5, and then to the fifth toe, testing S1. The test is performed initially either on the patient's arm or hand so that they can understand the sensation of what the pinprick feels like. Once they get that sensation understood, then what you have them do is close their eyes and then perform the test. A positive test is going to be a test in which the patient does not feel the sensation of the pinprick. This is going to again be repeated on the L4, L5, and S1 distributions looking for loss of protective sensation. is we get the person to advocate for their own feet, the patient. So we may teach the patient is whenever you're seeing your doctor who usually does these foot exams, take your shoes and socks off because, again, they're hard to uh, ignore. Data suggests that diabetic foot is adequately evaluated only 12 to 20 percent of the time. I would attest to that in family medicine. We really had to make a big push on put a process of care in place before we could get it routinely, routinely done. Okay, so in terms of the, the diabetic foot exam, one is to take a patient history. We'll go over those things to ask, and those are things you'll, you'll do with your patient on Friday. Do the physical exam and then provide patient education. So here's the things to ask. First of all, the first thing I ask is what kind of pro what problems are you having with your feet? So it's not a yes or no question, it's open-ended. They can't say, if you say, are you having problems with your feet, they'll say no. Or they may say yes. So you want to ask them, are you having any problem, what problems are you having with your feet? And if, if they tell you that, then you're going to follow up with that. Uh, if I don't know them, I would ask them how long you had diabetes, and then tell me what if your blood sugar's been running, and do you know your last A1C? Okay. So if it's high or out of range, then you can tell them. And I might ask them, is that normal for you? Is that pretty consistent? Okay. 
Then asking them things like, have you ever had an ulcer before? If they have had a previous ulcer, they're at higher risk for another ulcer, and that puts them at high risk for um, an uh, amputation down the road. Um, have they had a vascular compromise that might be, you might be able to elicit by, have they had angioplasty in their leg? Have they had a stent placed in their, uh, in their leg? Have they had leg bypass surgery? If they have, they'll, they'll know. Uh, have they had a foot wound that is not healing? Do you have something on your feet that hasn't healed or is hard to heal? Do you smoke? And then we talked about diabetes. Okay, so quick things there. And then asking of symptoms. Do you have any burning in your feet, tingling in your feet? Uh, do you have any pain, activity, or at rest? Uh, any changes in skin color? Now you're going to look, but just in case, you, they could draw your attention to it. So you're going to look for differences in color on one leg versus the other. One leg can have vascular compromise, the other one not. Uh, they will have temperature differences, cold and, and warm to touch. Um, have they had an amputation? You may not be able to tell if they've got a prosthesis and they're wearing long, long pants. Okay. Do they have regular podiatry? podiatry care. So when you turn 65 and you have Medicare, Medicare will pay for you to see a podiatrist three times a year, every four months. Okay? So that would be good to know because you could always call up the podiatrist and have them send the, the, um, their, his notes to you. So you can ask them, well, what did you see the podiatrist for? What did they do for you? They may cut their toenails, they may have to have surgery, or they may be seeking some corrective care. Is that Medicare coverage just for people with diabetes? Uh, I don't think so. Anybody? I think it's anybody. <laughs> Questions about these? So now let's look at the derm. What, so the, the big four things that you're going to look at is you're going to look at skin. You're going to do a neurologic exam, which will be the, the two things we're going to go over today. You're going to do musculoskeletal. You're going to look at their joints. You're going to look at dorsiflexion and plantar extension. Um, we'll look at the bottom of their foot to uh, pick up on an early Charcot joint. And, we're going to, and you'll look at vascular. So dermatologic, their toenails may be the most thing that draws your attention first. So looking for um, an ingrown toenail, that would be something that we'd need to do something about right away, this one. Okay. They could have discolored nails, so asking, so that could be fungal, it could be they have had trauma to it, it's bleeding under, it bled underneath, could be a melanoma, uh, very unusual, but some type of, well, tell me about this. So that's the big things I would ask is, okay, tell me about when did this happen? How long has it been there? What have you done about that? Um, these nails, this is a fungal nail. This is a fungal nail. These are elongated nails that haven't had any attention to them. So you're looking at the back of her foot, and they have grown back in around. Okay? Sometimes people can't get to their feet. Sometimes you see how thick and hypertrophic those keratotic they are? They can't cut them any longer. You have to get special nails, uh, clippers to cut them. So once they get so thick, they just can't do it anymore. Um, so that's where the podiatrist can help, if, especially if they are um, of that age and that coverage. The other would be looking between their toes. Always want to look between their toes. I tell you, I usually find uh, the, if I'm going to find macerated skin between the toes, it's usually the last two. Uh, if they're wearing shoes that are ill-fitting and it just smashes them together and they don't dry between their toes, um, or if they're, in, they're sharing a shower with multiple people, uh, it depends on the cleanliness of it, um, uh, the temperature, uh, like in the summer. So these are, this is athlete's foot, if you've had it. Um, this would be ways to, it would possibly look. So always looking in between the toes. You can be talking to the patient while you're doing this, too, and asking questions. So we certainly want to look for those breaks in skin, and we want to treat this um, as well. 
Uh, we'd also look for calluses and corns. Okay. So bottom of the feet, top of the feet. If, they're, if their toes are deformed, then calluses may be on the top of those joints instead of like on the, the corn. And the other thing I always do is when the patient is taking off their shoes, I pick up the shoes and I look at the shoes. I look inside, I'll even feel inside to see what is there. Usually I was dealing with a resource poor group, so they usually had very poor shoes. Um, so you can use that as a way to, uh, to talk to them. If you have women who come in with, no, uh, with sandals, talking to them about the importance of, of wearing shoes that aren't, you, you, you're almost talking to the wall, but not wearing sandals and how that can lead to injury for them. Really pointed shoes, very tall heels, all of those can lead to deformities. Uh, so looking all over and noting those, so you'll note those on your patient and, and draw a picture. The problem with calluses is that they tell you that that area is, is, have, has, is under undue pressure or undue friction. Okay. The problem with calluses is if they get big enough and hard enough, they will ulcerate underneath. So you'll get an ulcer underneath and it'll bleed and eventually it will form a, a really nasty ulcer. Uh, those heels, if they get um, hyperkeratotic enough, they will split and fissure. You always want to look for those. So on this foot, this is a more, this is a foot where this poor person has all kinds of trouble. So you can see this one's got more of a claw foot or a hammer toe, and so here's where the callus is on top. Uh, the common place for calluses are on those little toes, especially on ill-fitting uh, shoes. So you want to look for those fissures in between. Uh, they've got bunions, uh, noting those and looking to see if they're inflamed. That fissure on the bottom, it is a place, it's a portal for bugs, uh, for bacteria to enter, so you certainly want to, to note those. I like this model because if you look just at the top of the feet, it looks great. This is a really good looking foot, but when you turn it over, they've got ulcers. Okay. So looking all over the feet. So that's one of the first things I do is I just do an overall visual inspection, looking between the toes while I'm talking to them, and that gets me kind of the gross appearance um, already started. Hopefully when you take the shoe off, you won't find anything like this. I have. I have done this. Uh, where you've got a black toe. Had a lady who one time came in, she was African American. It was really hard. I would have missed it if she hadn't told me. She said, my toe is really, really bothering me. And so sure enough, she had, she had necrosed a, an entire toe, this one, in the middle, which we had to have removed. Um, looking for, so this is game green. This is really a bad, bad thing. Um, so this, uh, this, I have taken shoes off to find this, to find this, to find these. These are real pressure places. You can see it's the end of the toe, the, the, big, the underside of the big toe. You can see on that she's got claw toes. So those are pressure. Uh, the other thing you can do is look for, as I'm looking, I'm also uh, looking for edema. As I'm going up the leg, I'm, I'm feeling for swelling. I'm looking for temperature differences. Um, I told you about the soria, the, the my lady who had psoriasis on the bottom of her feet. She's cut them off with a, a scissors. This is what her foot looked like. This is psoriasis on the bottom of the foot. Here's those fissures. Here is something to pay attention to. So look for foot deformity, look for a prominent metatarsal head, okay, so that, and it will usually be where it shouldn't be. Uh, claw or hammer toes, I'll show you those, a rock, rock or bottom foot deformity, bunions, or a prior amputation. If they've had a toe removed, then they're, they're at, at higher risk, because once you have a toe removed, your, your toes you use for pushing off, I think 
Maria Jones will talk about some of this. So it starts to make the whole foot is going to mechanically act different. Uh, so looking for other pressure points, really important. So here's some uh, toe deformities. These are very common. Uh, you'll see hammer toes, the angle there, claw toes just a little bit different. You see this person's uh, deformity. Uh, so you see that they tend to get ulcerations uh, and sores up on those metatarsal heads. So look for it. Anybody who's got hammer toes or claw toes, they need special attention. Uh, and they really need to be talked to about how do you protect that, that foot or those toes. Here is a Charcot foot, uh, one that does not have an ulcer on it yet. Uh, and there's the x-ray of it. Uh, so be really, if you see these, uh, uh, referrals needs to be done. Vascular changes. So today we're going to look at dorsalis pedis and uh, the posterior tibial. Those are the two we're going to assess uh, on every patient that has diabetes. Uh, Y'all have done those mm -hmm. before, yes? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right, so you know where to find them. Okay, so get into your different groups and we'll start practicing. So why don't you just go ahead and go to the, the places where you were on yesterday. Thank <clears throat> you. 